What happens when a guitar company starts to put out guitars that compete with their own guitars? Uh, I don't know, maybe we should call Gibson. They could probably tell us. Guitar Stuff with John! Welcome to Guitar Stuff with John. We haven't been here for a while, and uh, the reason being, it took me a little bit of time to sort this video out, but you're going to find this fascinating. Uh, let's do a little history first. Epiphone. Epiphone started in 1873 in the Ottoman Empire by a man named Anastasio Stathopoulos. And he, at that time, was world-renowned for building ouds, mandolins, lutes, you name it, all the instruments from that part of the world. Then he moved to New York City in 1908. And his son, Epa, or they called him Epi as a nickname, uh, started, took over the company in 1908 and changed the name of the company, of course, to Epi Phone, his nickname and the word for voice. So let's flash ahead to 1957. There was two, two major guitar builders in the United States doing archtop instruments. One was Gibson. The other was Epiphone. And at that time, Epiphone was better quality guitar and cost more money than a Gibson. They were a major competitor. So in 1957, the Gibson Corporation basically completed a hostile takeover of Epiphone. And... You know, there's all kinds of legends and rumors about it, but almost, I think, vindictively, <laughs> Gibson said, okay, you're still Epiphone, but you're not building quality instruments anymore. You're going to build poor man Gibsons out of laminates and plywood. And that's the way it's been since 1957. Epiphone has been the poor man's Gibson. <sighs> which is a bit sad considering where Epiphone started. A world-renowned luthier that moved to the United States, probably for a better life at that point, began making absolutely incredible guitars right up until the 50s, and suddenly was taken over by one of the biggest corporations in the music industry and forced to make substandard instruments pretty sad. It is kind of sad, but it is the way of business. So, with all of that being said, what am I reviewing? Well, last year there was an announcement made by Epiphone that it was going to be putting out a line of guitars called Inspired by Gibson. So, the first thing I thought of when I heard that was, that's kind of a strange thing to even say. Of course, they're, they're inspired by Gibson. They're owned by Gibson. That's what they build. They build Gibsons that people can afford, but they'll never be a Gibson because they're not allowed to use the same materials, the same specs, all of these things that's preventing them from actually building wicked guitars, even though they do. They have built wicked guitars all along, even though they're laminate and less quality materials. Epiphones are a highly respected instrument. They always have been. So I went to my local shop, and guess what? I ordered one. I ordered the guitar that is one of my dream instruments to own, a, a J200, which I could never afford because a J200 in Gibson dollars in this country is well over 5,000 Canadian. Closer to six, actually. Sometimes you can see one for $5,500, Depending on the, uh, you know, on the, what the guitar is, the, the, there might be a limited edition, there might be whatever, but they are immensely expensive. 
But when I got this guitar in, I was, well, I'll just show it to you. This is the Epiphone inspired by Gibson J200. Um, <laughs> uh, look at this guitar. There's so much, so many things about this guitar that freak me out when I get my hands on it. First of all, the finish. The finish is a, a semi satin. Obviously, they say it's a poly finish, but I don't think it. It feels like a nitro finish. The back and sides are solid maple, and they are absolutely friggin' gorgeous. This guitar, built in Indonesia by Epiphone, is one of the most startling guitars I've ever played. Listen at this thing. I'm just going to get the mic up here. Now, mind you, all my videos are the same. There's no effects. There's no compression. There's no EQ. It's just coming through the single Aston Origin mic from about a foot away. So here you go. unbelievable it's unbelievable this guitar sounds in my opinion better than a j200 it it has all of the qualities of a j200 except the bottom end is tuned to not be muddy to not be overpowering it has crisp brilliant mids and high end it's a this thing is a is a is a jumbo killer especially when you're going to pay $6,000 for the jumbo when this is just over $1,000 Canadian. It's unbelievable. Even comes with a Fishman pickup, which I don't use. I will, I'm going to pull that out and put a K and K in this, but the neck is to die for. Action is flawless. These are the old beat up bench strings. Uh, that I've been using it since I got it. I've never changed the strings on it yet. It still sounds incredible. They're not coated. They're not nothing. They're just Diodario, you know, uncoated regular bench strings. And it tempers really well. There's our J200. And then, then I was really interested. I started to get my um, guitar antenna went up. And I found that there was, well, there's four or five more models, but two more I was really interested in. And so I found this. That's right, the Hummingbird. Inspired by Gibson, built in the same plant in Indonesia. A masterpiece of guitar, a masterpiece. Um, the same beautiful semi-satin finish, solid mahogany back and sides, and just at $1,000 Canadian. This might well be one of the best sounding dreadnoughts 
I've ever had my hands on. Watch. Bent strings again. This one needs a bit of a truss adjustment because I just haven't got around to it, but I've been recording with this thing already. strings. That one's really giving me hell. There it is. When I put a set of elixirs on this thing, <laughs> it's going to be frightening. It's unbelievable. I've wanted a hummingbird my whole life, and I've never bought one. You know why? Because they're 5000 bucks or more, and... I can't find one that sounds like this. It's an Epiphone, people. It's an Epiphone. So that wasn't bad enough. Then I had to check out to see what was going to happen when they took their hand and applied it to this. You guessed it. The J45. The Songwriter's Workhorse. Again, beautiful, beautiful fit and finish on this guitar. Um, <sighs> mahogany, or sorry, this might be, this one might be rosewood. Yes, all solid rosewood. And sorry to tell you, for nine hundred dollars, you basically get a J forty five that sounds like this. <laughs> God. This thing actually hurts your friggin' head. It's so loud and perfect. This is everything that I want in a J45 guitar. Everything. And I have yet to be able to find a single Gibson in my lifetime that ever sounded like this. I've heard them. I've seen other people own them. But do you think I could go into a store and get one? No. I've never heard one yet. And if I did hear one that was close to this, it was unplayable. The action was terrible. The neck felt horrible. Man, this neck is to die for. Fast, the action is perfect. And the intonation is perfect. Even with bent strings on it. So, that's 
that's all I got to say. Let's take a close look at these three guitars real quickly. And then I want to talk to you real seriously about something I've been stewing on for, for a long time. Mostly because of what happens on this channel. And the people I get to talk to who I love and who are such guitar heads. We all just do this because we're guitar heads. But listen, let's look at these things. It's going to blow your mind. So, let's start with our J200. You'll notice right away that the finish on this guitar, there's a lot of dirt and dust in this thing, because I've been playing the crap out of this guitar. Uh, I believe that there's bone on this. The fret markers are appear to be real mother of pearl. I don't believe that they're plastic. They don't feel plastic. The neck is bound in common, uh, that man-made sort of bone. It's a, but the everyday, it's not plastic either. It doesn't feel or look plastic. And uh, down here to the uh, traditional fretboard ending. And then we look at the top and we see it's ringing just from me talking. The our pick guard, which is slightly different than a real uh, J200, and I have to say that right here, the pick guard is lifting. Imagine that on a Gibson. But I call. We called from the shop, and the uh, rep said. Uh, don't you worry, I'm sending another pick guard right now. If that one ever comes right off, we'll replace it for free. So good on them for realizing that there's uh, there can be problems with these pick guards. And uh, anyhow, there's our top, a tone top. It looks like Sitka. And our bridge, which is made of rosewood. And uh, this is that more of that mother of pearl you can see the grain in it it's very very nice plastic pins gag and uh yeah there's your mustache bridge and then when we look at the sides of this guitar <laughs> oh my god the look at the flame in that just look at that and look at the way that the the finish is it's not matte it's not gloss and it seems way too thin to be poly. So I'm thinking it is some variant of nitro finish. I don't know what, how the hell they're doing it, but... And then, of course, the back is just to die for. Look at that grain. Look at that grain. When I move it. Oh, man, oh, man. It is absolutely gorgeous. All solid. All solid. I'll say that again all friggin' solid for a thousand dollars. And then our neck, the typical SJ200 neck, maple as well. You can see the nice grain in it. And there we have the uh, Made in Indonesia sticker. Your QC pass. It has, appears to have real Clusen Deluxe. They're, of course, they're called, they're called Epiphone, but they, but they really are beautiful machine heads. They're tight, responsive. They don't slip. They're just gorgeous. All right, let's move on to the Hummingbird. And here's our Hummingbird. Epiphone all the way. Hummingbird. Same type of inlays. Definitely not plastic. They, they're definitely not plastic. I could tell if they were. Same binding. Really nice, really nice job. Everything, the fit and finish of these guitars is incredible. And here we have our top. And there's our pick guard. Again, it's slightly different than a real Hummingbird pick guard. And this one is not lifting off. Thank God. And there's a gorgeous finish again. And the sunburst on this thing is just beautiful, beautiful sunburst. Rosewood Bridge. Uh, definitely bone or tusk for saddle and nut. 
plastic pins. And then the sides. Beautiful mahogany. Look at the grain on that neck. All solid mahogany back and sides. Look at that. Look at the grain in the back of this thing. You turn it, it just it just leaps out at you. Two piece back, no stripe. And then on this guitar, there's a very cool grain stripe right here. Look at that. And it goes up the neck. I love that. Look at that. How unique is that? And then, of course, at the back of the headstock, we got the Epiphone Deluxe Tuners again. And, uh, yeah, this is a monster, monster guitar. Monster. Now the J45. The J45 has a gold-painted uh, logo with butter bean tuners. And uh, just like a real 45, it's plain Jane, rosewood fingerboard, plain pearl dots. Same, uh, almost an aged look binding, right? Still got the porn on the pick guard here. Never took the plastic off yet. Let's take a close look. So here's your pick guard. Also not lifting. Good job, guys. Rosewood, plastic, Blech. and again, bone, saddle and nut. The top is gorgeous. Oh, damn, I love this finish. And, of course, rosewood, mahogany neck, rosewood back and sides. Beautiful, dark rosewood, all solid. The guitars are all solid, each one of them. And just look, look at that. It's ridiculous. It's, it is. It's really ridiculous how nice this wood is. And again, up the back of the headstock, there's our made in Indonesia. Way to go, boys. QC Pass, Epiphone Deluxe Nickel Hardware. They're, all the machine heads on these guitars are excellent. And there you go. There's the J45. And just, I mean, just look. Look. There's not even $3,000 worth of guitars sitting in front of us right this second. And I'm telling you what. <laughs> you'd have to pay another two or 3000 just to get one of these if the name on the headstock was Gibson. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So proud of these guys for building these guitars. So, what does this all mean? Well, it means a lot of positive things. One of the things it means is that you can now buy, uh, basically buy a Gibson for, uh, like one fifth of the price of a Gibson. And if you are a Gibson lover, these guitars will absolutely floor you because I want to mention a couple things. Um, so I had no control and, and never do, but particularly in this case, I had no control over which units were actually sent to my local shop. All three of these guitars came from three different stores across Canada and were drop shipped to my local Long and McQuaid. So, and all three of them are cannons. So what does that mean? It means the law of 20% uh, doesn't apply to these because there's just no way that all three of these guitars would be cannons if there was a preponderance of bad ones in the stockpile. I have actually played only one of these that I thought was bad, and it wasn't bad. It just wasn't 
set up the way I would like, and it was a cutaway version of the J45, and it seemed to be lacking something. Not sure what, but I wouldn't have bought it. But then the one that I had shipped in without the cutaway, oh my God, well, it's amazing. They're amazing. So that means that a, that a vast number of these guitars are actually friggin' incredible. And, and that's amazing. You can put 15 Gibsons in a row and only find one or two or three that really blow your mind. The rest of them are good, right? They're, they're Gibson. The same as Martin is Martin, Taylor is Taylor. They make great guitars. But do you need to pay over $5,000 Canadian for a guitar to buy the logo on the headstock? I'm going to tell you something I've been thinking about for a long time. I want to say, first of all, that I absolutely love the interaction that I get from my subscribers and the people who contact me here on this channel through these videos. And I hear every kind of story and every kind of situation and opinion. And I want to say something I, I want to tell you about what I've been thinking about, and I've spoken at length with my wife, Ginger, about this, because she's a very intelligent woman, and I, we had a long conversation this morning about this. I'm going to tell you what I think happens to all guitar players. We are victims of something I'd like, I'd like to name, <laughs> uh, assumption of quality syndrome. Now, let me explain to you what that is. When you are born, and it's a cultural thing, right? If you're born in, the, in North America and you live here all your life or spend any time here at all or, or watch this culture from the outside, what happens is this. You gravitate to a musician, a famous musician. Let's pick, in my case, Doc Watson. So what happens is, as I'm growing up, a little boy, and I watch Doc play, I realize he's playing a Gallagher guitar. Subsequently, my entire life I spent waiting for the day when I would own a Gallagher guitar. So there's a chance the Gallagher they sent me this last summer might have been a dud, and then where would I be? Right? Couldn't. A kid denounced Gallagher after my, spending my whole life wanting one. The same thing if you watch Tony Rice. You watch Tony Rice, he's playing that old D28 herringbone that's probably the most flat, famous flat top guitar in the world. But it has a Martin logo on the headstock. So you, are, you grow up loving Rice or loving whoever you listen to. And their guitar of choice becomes your standard. Here's two things you got to remember. Number one, you can never own Rice's guitar. It may be a Martin, of course, but you can't own that Martin and no other Martin sounds like his guitar. You're a victim of the assumption of quality syndrome. You think because he's playing it that all Martins or, you know, there is a Martin out there that will sound like that, will make you play better, sound more like Tony, whatever. But none of it's true. All of these guys, especially the early guys in music, right? They didn't have a lot of choice of builders. Rice didn't have any choices. He, he found the Martin he loved because it belonged to Clarence White and, that, and made that his guitar. But here's a good, here's a good indicator. When Rice had to uh, get his get the bone repaired and couldn't take it on the road, he didn't go. He needed to build another guitar that would match the bone in some way, right? He didn't go to Martin. He went to Santa Cruz Guitars. Why? Why didn't he go to Martin? Why didn't he go to Martin and say? I'd like you to build me a guitar that matches this one. They built the guitar he was talking about. His main axe was a Martin. 
but he didn't get Martin to build his replacement. He went to Santa Cruz. Boy, that's a big teller, right? And the only reason I bring these things up and why I, can, why I say to you that I would m m much more highly recommend buying this guitar than a Gibson is because I want guitar players to be happy, right? And if you can get a fantastic guitar that is inexpensive and, f and ticks all the boxes, why wouldn't you do it, right? Don't be fooled by your love of your favorite artist's acts because that's not where it's at. You, if you do that, if you fall victim, as we all do, I did, I have, I still list Martins, Gibsons, uh, Bourgeois, all these companies, I still list them on my list of, dr of dream guitars. But the reason I love them is the nostalgia, the, the cultural DNA, right, of watching Rice play a Martin, Lester Flat play a Martin, Christofferson play a Gibson, Emmylou Harris play a Gibson. It's, it's my own personal journey that led me to love these brands, to love Taylor because of Dan Crary. Don't be fooled by it. Don't be fooled. If you, if you want to find your dream guitar, search. Make the search meaningful. Try things that you would never consider. You might be shocked by what you find out from trying an L-Series Yamaha or a Boucher or a Yeri or a Gallagher or a Recording King or any maker. Any maker could be holding your dream instrument, the instrument that makes you every bit of musician that you can be. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And as we travel through life right now, in this, in these times of pandemic, and not able to travel, not able to see friends and family, not able to do the things that we normally have done, music becomes the great equalizer and the great healer, right? So love guitars. Don't just love one brand. Love every brand. Every guitar has some quality that can change your life and change your playing, change the direction of your, of your creative thought process. So don't fall victim to the assumption of quality based upon the fact that someone that you love or uh, to listen to or whatever plays a certain instrument, it doesn't mean that all of those instruments are going to be like your hero's instrument. It could be something else entirely. So there's my review of these guitars, and I can't, I just, I still am confused <laughs> by what Gib, what is Gibson thinking <laughs> by doing this. But at the same time, if I found this guitar with a Gibson logo on it that sounded like this, I would buy it in a heartbeat. I would spend the money. I really would. I've done it before. <sighs> There's no question that what, once you get that guitar, guitar acquisition syndrome thing, you're, you never stop looking and you never stop loving. You, you never lose your brand loyalty. Just don't let brand loyalty cheat you out of finding something amazing that you're not expecting. And that's it for this edition of Guitar Stuff with John. I love you guys. I love you if you play guitar. I love you if you don't. I love you even more if you hit subscribe and like. And if you want to join our private membership, please feel free. All the information is right below the video here. And by God, the boys in Indonesia really tore this up. I'll tell you right now. get this ending. Yeah, right.
What is wrong with you? What a dick. <laughs>